have a dream that our lives might be different, that we underestimate what we can do in a year, accomplish together in partnership with God's Spirit. And so the image of what we're attempting for this year are to live lives that overflow for that, you know, that image in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over, and that it runs over with the very goodness and the mercy of God, that we can become living water for an empty age. And the way that we do this is by following in the way in Jesus. And we learn to spend time with him, to become more like him, to pattern and architect our lives in the very way that he did. And in doing so, that means that we will organize our life around a variety of different practices. In February, we talked about prayer. March, we talked about Sabbath. And then in April, we are now talking about secrecy and confession. And when we put together kind of the roadmap for the year, people were often like, okay, confession I get. Like, I remember reading about that. I come to church. We confess together. And I know that I'm supposed to confess my sins. But secrecy isn't isn't secrecy a bad thing? That's not something that you're supposed to cultivate. That's something that you're supposed to eradicate from your life. And so Vicki last week preached our introduction on confession with that important passage from 1 John, that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And yet we have this opportunity to confess our sin to the righteous, the faithful one, and that God cleanses us and forgives us. So what does it mean for us to have secrecy, not just confession, as a spiritual discipline? And how are these two things related to one another? Well, if you stop to think about it for a little bit, your life has two different dimensions to it. You have the visible part of your life and you have the invisible part of your life. You have what is known about your life and you have what is hidden. You have your inner life, you have your outer life, you have your public life, you have your private life. That every moment of every day, you've got these two different kind of realms of your life. There's your public life, there's what you're wearing, there's what you're saying, there's what people know about you. There's what you do. Then you have your inner life, your your thoughts, your feelings, your values, your convictions. And other people aren't necessarily privy to what is going on in your inner life. You have those things that are above the waterline and you have those things that are below the waterline. And neither one of these two things is bad. It's not like private life good, public life bad, or vice versa. It's that these two things are necessary and feed off of one another and need to be held together in the appropriate kind of lanes. Because for sure, if you have a public life without a private life, your life is just a show. And if you have a private life, but you don't have a public life, you're just living in isolation or in seclusion. And so we need both of these different realms, and we need them to be understood properly. And when we get these things out of alignment, we do great harm to ourselves and to others. When people have pushed back a little bit and is like, hey, secrets are bad, I I like to say, no, there's good kinds of secrets and there's bad kinds of secrets. And we all know about the bad kinds of secrets, right? The bad kinds of secrets are the things, the parts of your life that you try to hide that other people don't know about so that they won't think ill of you. But there's also good secrets, right? Some of you are starting to think about what are you going to get of your wife, your mother, or the person, you know, for Mother's Day or for a birthday. or that, that, That's a good kind of secret, right? So not all secrets are bad. There's some good ones. And hopefully by the time we get to the end of this message, you'll understand why good secrets are critically important to our life of faith. And that this isn't something that we just kind of made up in the curriculum. This is not something obscure. Jesus puts the idea of secrecy as a spiritual habit or rhythm. As he puts it front and center in his message, the Sermon on the Mount, right in the heart of it. Jesus doesn't just have a passing reference to it. He puts this discipline right in the soul of the most important speech he ever gave. Matthew chapter 6, starting in the first verse, Jesus says this. Be careful not to practice your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For if you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. And so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets like the hypocrites do in order to be recognized by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. 
But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret. And your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the street corners in order to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not disfigure your face or look somber like the hypocrites do. For they change their face in order to show other people that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. When you fast, pour oil on your head, wash your face, so that your fasting is not obvious to others, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Three different examples Jesus gives of holy and good kinds of secrets. Giving to the poor, praying, and fasting. Now, notice Jesus doesn't say if you do these things, but when you do these things. In other words, these are the kinds of things that Jesus' followers do. And they're good things. I don't think anybody would say anything about that, hey, giving and fasting and praying are bad things in and of itself. No, they're good things. But Jesus is giving a warning here that you can be doing a good thing and be doing it in the wrong way and with the wrong motives, and that good thing becomes warped. It becomes twisted. It gets manipulated in such a way where the good thing turns out to be a bad thing. And the question is, why? How does that happen? I remember when we were in California, our girls were in elementary school, and we were sitting down to dinner. The kids were old enough that we needed to bring them into something that was happening that was not for public consumption yet, but I didn't want them to find out about it from like the grapevine, and so I needed to let them in on a secret. So we sat down for dinner, and I said, I said kids, I, I need to tell you a secret. Danica, who is our oldest child, leaned in. I mean, this is like her best life now. She loves the tea. She's like, spill it, let's go. And Ashby, literally, true story, got up and left the room. <laughs> because Ashby knew herself really well that if she heard what we were going to say, she wasn't keeping it a secret. It was going to come out. She couldn't help herself. Which leads me to the question that I need you to ponder for a moment. Why is it so hard to keep a secret? Turn to the person next to you and answer this question. Why is it so hard to keep a secret? Ready, set, go. So there is a drive, there is a desire, there is a way that all of us have been created, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, that we, all, we were all made to be known and to be seen and to be heard. And we all live with that, that we live with the hope that we will be known and seen and heard. And what was happening with Ashby and what happens to us when we tell a secret is that when we reveal that secret, we, we get known a little bit, right? We get listened to. We get seen as somebody who's important because we've got information. And again, those three things of being known, seen, and heard, they're good things. That's the way that God has made us. But what happens is, is those good drives can get twisted in such a way that it becomes something that it was never meant to be. And we seek being known and seen and heard in ways that are not good for us and they're not good for other people. The short phrase answer to why keeping secrets is so hard 
it comes with this warning. It's something that's called approval addiction. John Ortberg describes how do you know if you have approval addiction. He puts it like this. If we find ourselves often getting hurt by what others say about us, by people expressing other than glowing opinions about us, we probably have it. If we habitually compare ourselves with other people, if we find ourselves getting competitive in the most ordinary of situations, elbow your friend if that's true for them, we probably have it. If we live with a nagging sense that we aren't important enough or special enough or get envious of another success, we probably have it. If we keep trying to impress important people, we probably have it. If we are worried that someone might think ill of us should he or she find out we are an approval addict, we probably are. (laughs) Approval addiction is when our drive to be known and seen and heard gets put on steroids and we seek to have that constantly from the people around us. And so Jesus gives us a warning. And the way he puts it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, is this. Will you say this with me in unison? Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And so in the midst of this warning, Jesus gives us three different dimensions of this. The literal translation of when he says, be careful against, is literally to be on guard against. It's very concrete language. We ought to set up a defense. We ought to be aware of and make sure that we are being diligent against something, that we're under attack. And what the attack is that we need to be paying attention to is that we are trying to live our life, what is referred to as practicing of our righteousness. That's just a fancy way of however you orient your life to tell you that yourself that you're okay or that you're good. Everybody's brain, everybody's life is centered around how am I okay? How am I good? And we can do that in a way sometimes that we are trying to sink our own righteousness by being seen by others. Let me be clear about this. It is not bad to be known to be a person who gives to the needy, who prays, and who fasts. What is dangerous is doing those things in such a way that you are doing them so that other people notice that you're doing them. It's thinking about who is your target audience? when you do those things? What are you really aiming for? Will Rogers once said, men often hit what they aim at. And if you were aiming for the human audience of being recognized to do these things, you'll get your reward. Which leads to that third part. If we're doing these things in order to be seen by other people, Jesus is saying you'll have no reward. The literal language of that is no paybacks from your Father in heaven. This is not about God being up in heaven and being stingy and being like, you didn't do that the way I wanted you to, and therefore I'm not going to give you a reward. This is about if we are seeking the approval of others as we do things, the reward is that we often get the approval of others. And so, what's the goal of secrecy as a spiritual practice? The goal of secrecy is to be able to live without human approval. And so what you do in a spiritual training exercise, because remember, all of these are about training and righteousness. What we do is we intentionally do a variety of things without human approval, without human recognition. Find anything that's good that you can do and do it without anybody knowing about it. Do it and make sure that you don't get the credit. That is a training exercise for us making sure that we perform for an audience of one and that we're not constantly addicted to what others think about it. This is, this is way harder than even it was in Jesus' day and age. I mean, the seeds of this have always been there, but today's technology with the likes and the hearts and all of that and the retweets, all of that is a, just a whole neural engine that makes us live 
for the approval of other people. In fact, I was reading this week on some technology stuff, and I came across a phrase I had never come across before, and it's the phrase that all of this technology pushes us to be forever elsewhere. It pushes us to be in a dimension where we are addicted to what others think about us. I mean, you th- think about this. A wedding today is categorically different than it was a, a generation ago. Because a wedding today is not just what's happening in the room with regard to the guests that are there. A wedding today is often judged also by, is it Instagram worthy? What's happening in the wedding that's getting posted, what pictures are being said, so that it makes it out into the elsewhere dimension of what's going on. And so what, what can you do as an antidote to the approval addiction that's just got a stranglehold on us today? Let me give you a couple of biblical antidotes for this. The first antidote is this. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. The first antidote is this. Just realize God sees you. Now, most of the time when we think about God seeing us, we think about God sees you in regards to he sees all of the bad things that you're doing that nobody knows about. But guess what? The true, the, that, that's true, but it's true also in the reverse. It's true in the sense of God sees the good things that you do that nobody knows about. God recognizes that there are times where you do good things and nobody gives you any accolades for what that is. And so the first thing that you need to do to kind of inoculate yourself against approval addiction is to say, God, I know you see me and that I can live my life before you. I mean, think think about this just for a second, just even in regards to what's happening right now in a sermon moment. Am I preaching to you for you to be able to pat me on the back afterwards? or to send me a nice email, or to think well of me as your pastor? Or is my primary drive to know that God sees the work that I'm doing, and that I am doing so in such a way to seek his reward over your human favor? And that's not just true for preachers. That is equally as true for every dimension of your life and what you do in your work and your play and in your home. Why are you doing what you're doing? Second antidote is this. Seek first his kingdom. This comes just a few verses later after what we read. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. Everybody has a choice. You're either seeking your own righteousness, your own inner sense of well-being, that I'm okay, that I'm good. Or you're seeking God's righteousness. There's only two paths. Your brain, your, your life is hardwired to seek righteousness. It's only a question of where you're getting that righteousness. And the categorically different thing about the gospel is that God's righteousness is available to you regardless of who you are and what you've done. And that you can live out of the overflow or the abundance of his righteousness for you. And that if you're truly swimming in that reality, that that breaks your addiction to needing to have the approval of others. Because you know you have the approval of your Father in heaven. And so if you've never bent a knee to that, if you've never never, ever prayed that prayer to God, I want to seek your righteousness and not my own. That's what changes this whole equation. Third antidote. Third antidote comes from Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now what? Hidden. You have a hidden dimension to your life that nobody but God knows about. And God preserves in the work in the cross and in the empty tomb, God has taken what you might think would be lost, what might be obscure. Your whole life is now protected and hidden in God himself. You will not be lost. You will be redeemed. 
Let me see if I can illustrate these for you, this kind of secrecy and how this plays out. Here's a, an image of a drawing of two famous people from the 19th century. This, these are the Spurgeons. Charles Spurgeon is one of the greatest generational preachers of a century. He, it was said that Charles Spurgeon could preach to 10,000 people without the use of amplification. Every time I read about Charles Spurgeon, I feel like a wimp as a preacher. <laughs> Amazing fruit and revival from Spurgeon's preaching. They lived on a farm. On the farm, he and his wife, they had a hen house. They had eggs. Sometimes their neighbors didn't have eggs. Their family members didn't have eggs. They had eggs. And so sometimes their friends and their neighbors would come and ask and be like, hey, can I, can I have a couple eggs? And the Spurgeons would be like, absolutely. That'll be $2.36 or whatever the price of eggs was back then. Didn't matter. If they were family members, friends, they would charge them. And you just need to know that Charles Spurgeon living this great public life of like, totally preaching out there. And then there was some serious scuttlebutt about the Spurgeons. You know what? He preaches. There's a lot of grace. Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> Gosh, that makes me happy. You know how often I have wanted to do that in church? So what we discover is that... Um, that's what a, what a strange, like, movie reference that just came out of my mouth, right? Like, how old is that guy? That's like a 15-year-old movie reference. Get some current material, pal. Okay, anyhow. So, what ends up happening is the Spurgeons are only willing to sell their eggs, and people are just super critical of them. He dies, then she dies. At her funeral, we don't find out the true story until after she dies. Wife dies, two elderly widows show up at her wedding and share with people that for decades, all the proceeds of those eggs went to support them. All the criticism they endured, they gladly and willingly endured. Why? Because their human audience was not their primary audience. They were doing what they were doing before God and for God alone. They were practicing in a very public life, a dimension of their life that is secrecy. 26 years ago, April 9th, there was a young woman by the name of Kelly Beckham who had a backpack on her back and was coming down out of Hodge Hall at Princeton Theological Seminary when one of my friends intercepted her before she could leave, handed her a brand new book by her favorite author, a red rose, and had a note and said, congratulations, you're going on a special Holy Week scavenger hunt. She looked at this and she's like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Kelly's like, I got a PhD seminar that she had been invited into and for that semester that she was auditing. I'm going to my PhD class. So she walks outside. Outside, it's a beautiful day in New Jersey in April. It's 43 degrees and raining. <laughs> and her roommate is there with her car. And Lauren says, where are you going? Because Kelly starts walking to class. And Lauren says, no, you're not. You're going on a scavenger hunt. It's Holy Week. Kelly's like, I'm not doing that. Lauren says, you will enjoy this. Get in the car right now. So Kelly begrudgingly throws her backpack in the car and gets in the car and goes to the first place. It's a clothing store where she liked to buy her clothes. And there was, at the store, there was a note and a red rose that would send her to another place. It was another kind of dimension of her life together. Uh, the ice cream store and some of these different places. And in each place, there was a little clue. And Kelly did not understand what was happening until she got to the wine store where there was a little French man behind the counter. And he's like, oh, oh, oh mademoiselle, today is a good day for you. And she sees the expense of the bottle of the wine that's sitting there, and she reads in the note where we're going to dinner, all of a sudden, all of everything drains out of her in the color because she realizes this is not a Holy Week scavenger hunt. Rich is somewhere with some hardware, and he's about to propose to me. And so the French man goes, Mademoiselle, are you okay? <laughs> she's wet. She's cold. 
She goes from there to a payphone. All the young people in your room. This is so hard to coordinate in the olden days. I had to get her friend to constantly call that payphone that was on the corner at Nassau Street until Kelly would answer it because she was going to read a poem that was terrible that I wrote about friendship to give to Kelly. And from there, she got sent to the Princeton University Chapel that I had bribed people to close for that day. And I'm in there. I'm at the front of the church, down the aisle. Back doors of the church open up. She is dripping wet and as mad as a hornet. And she comes down the aisle, and she says, literally, first thing Kelly said to me in this moment, what are you doing? I had a speech, friends. I had a great speech about life and love and everlasting. I just said none of it. Had never have. (laughs) Just got to a knee and proposed right then and there, cut to the chase. Do you know how long I worked on that secret? How much I had to scheme and lie and plan. And all that time in that secret, I am putting fuel in the fire of our intimacy and our love. When you do a secret, you don't yell it. You whisper it. You get close. Many of you, your life with God is so dry right now. When was the last time you paid attention to that hidden and holy part of the inner life that you have with God? When have you ever had a secret with God? No one else knows. Here's the question. Will you become a secret agent? If I've learned anything about marriage in the last quarter of a century, is there is a mysterious dimension to my bride that I will never know. And the minute that I forget that, the minute I think I've got her all figured out, The minute that I don't honor the fact that she has a hidden life before God, it's the minute that I've destroyed our love. Some of you need in your intimacy with God to become an agent. There's more, more love, more grace, more truth, more knowledge, more kindness, more patience. There's more. But not if everything's for show. And that means that we get to become eventually a secret society, if you will. Because this worship isn't just a performance. And our education is not just to prove how smart we are. And our service is not a PR campaign. Part of the reason that the church is suffering today is because we're obsessed with the public dimension of ministry and we have forgotten the hidden dimension of ministry. And that there ought to be a lot of goodness below the waterline as people got to know and be a part of what was happening in this church. So this isn't hard this week. Think of something good. Do it. Don't tell anyone about it. Just do it before God. And let's pray. Forgive us for ignoring the invisible dimension of our lives with you, O God. That yes, you call us to let our light shine before others, but you also call us to go to the secret place. Help us to not fall into the traps of showmanship or seclusion, and help us to heed your warning to be careful. Help us to know and 
to see and to hear other people as we seek those things, but don't allow us to be addicted to approval. May we have your righteousness and not our own. May we seek your reward and not our own paybacks. Help us to not be forever elsewhere, but to be forever with you. And I pray, O God, that there would be more in this sanctuary, more hidden, more mysterious, deep dimension of our lives. Make us secret agents, becoming a secret society. Give us good secrets. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.